Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for planting the seed of your word in our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that as we place our, our minds, our hearts, our emotions, all of our beings under the authority of your word, that you would enliven us to hear what you have to say to us this morning, that you would give us the grace to respond in obedience, and above all, that you would point us to Jesus so that we may find altogether everything in him. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I ask you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 35. And as you're doing so, I have a question for you. What do you put your hope and your trust in? At the end of last year, the Washington Post conducted a survey asking readers to describe in a word or a phrase what 2020 was like. Dumpster fire was the sixth most common. <laughs> Nightmare was number 11. The three top words, were exhausting, lost, and chaotic. And some readers elaborated. All of our challenges have been drawn out slow motion car wrecks from COVID to unemployment, to no sports, to some sports and no fans. It just keeps dragging on. I feel trapped in a corner and all I can do is try to block the next thing that gets thrown at me. Another wrote, this year feels like one very long season of a TV show that keeps throwing random plot devices and crazy situations at viewers just to keep itself on the air. This year can't end quickly enough. The survey also asked readers to describe what they were hopeful for in 2021. Responses included uniting the world, a restoration of sanity, normalcy, morality. One reader wrote, I'm most hopeful that it won't be 2020. I also hope to get a puppy and have some tacos, but not simultaneously. <laughs> this morning's Old Testament reading in Isaiah 35 is a message of hope predicated on the promises of the Lord. And they can serve as a great source of encouragement for God's people in all generations, including for us today. Now the context of Isaiah 35 is chapters 28 to 35. And what we have in these chapters is an alternating messages, mostly to the Southern Kingdom, messages of judgment, and then messages of restoration. And chapters 34 and 35 serve as a climax actually not just to this section, but the whole first half of the book of Isaiah. And in chapter 34, Isaiah describes in gruesome language, the Lord summoning the nations before him to hear of the judgment that is about to come on them. And the nation of Edom is singled out in particular because they continually harassed Israel. And they represent all those who persist in their rebellion against the Lord and refused to trust him. And the picture at the end of 34 is that this once luxurious and rich Edom is reduced, it's decreated, it's reduced to a tohu vabohu, a wasteland, good for nothing more than the habitation of doleful creatures. Now Isaiah delights in contrast. So we get to chapter 35 and we get this beautiful picture of restoration. Isaiah here is anticipating the Babylonian exile, during which time the Israelites suffered a severe crisis of faith. They'd lost their land, their temple, and their sovereignty. Everything that had oriented their sense of identity and purpose and direction was gone. They were in danger of being engulfed by confusion and frustration. And in the midst of this despair, Isaiah gives three promises, the renewal of creation, the restoration of God's people, and a return to the Lord. 
In the first two verses, as was read earlier this morning, we see that the Lord will demonstrate his salvation in nature as the desert land, as well as the land that had been devastated by Israel's enemies, would come to life, bursting forth in joy and color and growth. The parched wasteland and desert would bloom as nature is transformed into an earthly paradise, entering into the joy of God's redeemed people. Particularly in verse 2, we read that Lebanon's glory will be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. Now, these three places, Lebanon, Carmel, and Sharon, they're all near the Mediterranean Sea, and they're all famous for their lush agriculture and beauty. And the desert will be so transformed that what made these three places glorious would also be given to the dry and parched land. And the result of this transformation is that they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Now we'll put aside for now whatever the antecedent of they is, but what Isaiah is describing here is that in this transition of nature, the true beauty and glory and honor of God himself would be made manifest to all. Now, the second promise is the restoration of God's people. And in verses three to seven, Isaiah now encourages the oppressed and downtrodden Israelites to take care of one another. They needed to be reminded of who their God was. And they needed this encouragement because their redemption seemed so, so far away. And so Isaiah exhorts them to mutual encouragement and strengthening. According to verse three, they're to strengthen the feeble hands and steady the knees that give way. Weak hands and feeble knees. Well, they're signs of anxiety, of fear, and of, and of exhaustion. The picture is of knees staggering and toppling as people are about to give way and stumble and fall to the ground. And then in verse four, Isaiah shifts from this outward manifestation, hands and knees, to describe the inward condition, those who have an anxious heart. Now, literally the Hebrew there is those who are hasty of heart because they're fearful or because they're impatient with the, the apparent delay of the Lord in fulfilling his promises. They're dissatisfied with God's purposes and his methods. And what's the message to those with weak knees and hands, those with anxious heart? Be strong, do not fear. Be strong, do not fear. Now, where have we heard those words before? You may remember in Joshua chapter one, right? The Israelites are perched on the plains of Moab about to enter the land of promise. And Joshua is giving these words. Now, why these commands, be strong, do not fear? On what basis? Is this just a precursor to Bobby McFerrin's? Don't worry, be happy, all will go well. No. Be strong, do not fear. Look at the rest of verse four. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. They're to be strong and they're to not fear based on the fact that the Lord has not abandoned his people and he was coming to deliver them. So this is no Hakuna Matata problem-free philosophy, okay? It's based on who the Lord is and his promises. And there's simply no unreliability to the promises of God. Just as the Lord was with the Israelites and Joshua on the eve of the conquest, so he was with his people in exile. And fear and dismay were to give way to courage since God had promised to be with them. And they're to give themselves, the Israelites, to mutual strengthening and encouraging, especially in times of darkness and despair. 
Listen to these words from Hebrews chapter three. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you are hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Brothers and sisters, encouragement is serious business. This is not merely a tip for victorious spiritual living, nor is it simply a function reserved for leaders. Jeff Mackey is not the paid encourager simply because he's the dean of students. This is something that we need to be giving ourselves to as long as it's called today. You see, an important means for withstanding the enticements to apostasy and despair is that of mutual encouragement, not just occasionally or on a particular occasion, but every day. What might this academic year hold if we commit today to fostering among ourselves a constant faith in God and his promises? Isn't it easy when times are difficult and we're dispirited to mutually incite a spirit of unbelief bitterness and bickering? Why do I have to wear a mask? I'm vaccinated. Why isn't everybody vaccinated? Who could possibly vote for Trump? Well, who could vote for Biden? How could we have Carol Swain here? Well, how could we have Jamar Tisby here? It's so easy. And these are all legitimate issues that we can have disagreements on. But these sinful attitudes of unbelief and bitterness and bickering are perennial dangers for us as believers. And we need to heed the warnings in scripture against mutual unconcern and the disastrous consequences that can ensue. We have a joyous opportunity as long as it's called today, as long as the present day of God's grace endures. And by the way, if you're one of the weak and crippled ones in Isaiah verse three, you're one of the ones with a fearful heart, Be open to the help and strengthening from other believers. Don't give in to the temptation to withdraw and hide. You know, this group assembled at the beginning of this academic year is not an accidental fellowship. The Lord in his providence has brought each one of us here. That's why I love hearing the testimonies of juniors. I love hearing how the Lord has brought each one of us to this point. We have majority world scholars this year from Kenya, from Nigeria. We have missionaries from New Delhi, Ethiopia, Lebanon. And we have students from Texas, California, Montana, and even humble Ambridge. Let's seize the opportunity and not squander the privilege of encouraging one another during these turbulent times. Then shall the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. We're told in verses five and six. Can't you hear the memorable music of the contralto soloist singing these verses in Handel's Messiah? I can, and I've been humming and singing them for weeks. (laughs) When exactly is this then of verses five and six? Well, the word then in prophetic literature is often a reference to the messianic time of salvation when the Lord comes to deliver his people. The promises given here in Isaiah 35 are too great and glorious for a single solitary fulfillment. It's fulfilled in stages. Certainly in 539 BC when Cyrus sent the Israelites home was a preliminary fulfillment of these promises. The incarnation, we saw literal fulfillments in the miracles of Jesus, as we read in Mark 7 in this morning's gospel reading. Remember in Matthew 11, John the Baptist is pining away in prison and he sends his disciples to Jesus. Are you the one or am I wasting my time in prison? Should we be looking for another? And do you remember Jesus's peculiar response? 
He sends John back to Isaiah 35. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the deaf hear. That and there are many, many, many other deliverances experienced by the Lord's people until Jesus comes again. And did you notice the nature of these blessings? The lame don't just walk, they leap like a deer. The mute don't just talk, they shout for joy. Water doesn't just trickle, it gushes forth in the desert. You see, when the Lord's miraculous power is at work, abundance replaces lack. And then the final and third promise, the return to the Lord. The chapter culminates in a homecoming, and it's not just a physical return from exile, but a spiritual turning to the Lord, as the Lord himself provides a way back to himself. He is the one who ensures that his people will return, and he promises to provide a secure highway to Zion. Now, this highway, this is the hapax in, in Hebrew, and it's a road that's lifted up. It really is a high way above the ground, a high and glorious road to travel on. It's not merely some faint path in the desert that can be wiped out with one sandstorm. And we're told there are three characteristics to this highway. According to verse eight, it's not for the unclean. Now, that's a cultic word in Hebrew. It's talking about those who refuse, as we sang in the first hymn this morning, to avail themselves of the means to be cleansed, the blood of bulls and goats in the time of promise in the Old Testament, and the blood of Jesus today in the time of fulfillment. It's a limited access highway only for God's people. The second thing in verse 8, we're told that even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's really good news. If you're like me, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. There are no exit ramps. God has guide rails, and we can't get off this highway. And then finally, it's secure, according to verse 9. No lions or ferocious beasts, and roads in the ancient Near East were quite dangerous. But on the Lord's prepared highway, nothing can molest God's people. They're completely safe from these menaces. And then finally, the imagery of verse 10, the astounding imagery. Okay? And, and again, the Lord is giving this promise in the midst of his people's rebellion. The ransom of the Lord, who have been far from Zion, along with creation, will one day be released from bondage and return in joy and thanksgiving, causing sorrow and sighing not to depart, but to flee forever. Now, this is all well and good, but here we are today with two-thirds of 2021 behind us. If today's edition of the Washington Post repeated their survey, how would you respond? Think for a moment. How would you describe in a word or a phrase the first two-thirds of 2021? And I'm going to pick on our dear Dan Omar. You are allowed to use the word joyous for this year. <laughs> I hope that was one of the words you were thinking of. <laughs> What words would you use to describe the first two thirds of this year? Well, in Handel's Messiah, after Isaiah 35, the soloist sings Isaiah 40, verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd, and he shall gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. And then we hear the same tune in a different key, as we next hear the soprano soloist sing the gracious divine invitation of Matthew 11. Come unto him, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and he will give you rest. Take his yoke upon you and learn from him, for he is meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. 
Brothers and sisters, let us come to the table with all our hopes and fears and disheartenments, and let's feed on Christ by faith in our hearts and find rest for our souls. Amen. Amen.